And well, with me now to discuss the limits of Western intervention in the Arab world are Douglas Murray, the author of the book Neoconservatism, Why We Need It, and the Syrian born journalist and writer Rana Kabani. And from New York, we're joined by Ian Bremer, author of The J Curve Why Nations Rise and Fall. Um, Ian Bremer, first of all, there seems to be in the States a confluence of two or indeed three things, one of which, of course, is the need to deal with the deficit. And the second is a kind of uneasy feeling about uh, the U.S. becoming embroiled in, in, in very different scenarios, and many of them in the Middle East, witnessed by the fact that even the air power in Libya has been reduced. Are we, are we witnessing now, as it were, a pullback? Well, uh, I would first say that having heard that excellent initial package that you put together for BBC, uh, it you know, sort of implies that there's this extraordinary sweep of news that's going through the Middle East that's dominating headlines. That's true in Britain. Uh, it's true in Europe. It's not true in the United States. Uh, the headlines have all been about Obama's birth certificate. Today they've been about 1.8% growth, less in the U.S. than people mm -hmm. expect. Unemployment, elections coming up, Romney is a pre potential presidential candidate. The appetite there's a real fatigue in the United States to talking about international stuff, talking about troops in Afghanistan, troops in Iraq, and talking about uh, what's happening in Libya. Uh, and so certainly there's a pullback in terms of a willingness for the Obama administration two years in to be engaged uh, and seen as already very, very stretched with lots of issues as being first and foremost mm. focused on foreign policy. They really want other countries to be doing the driving, and the U.S. is kind of the the last option uh, if, uh, if somebody needs uh, engagement. So, uh, Douglas Murray, do you see that as a sign of uh, marching them up the top of the hill uh, and leaving them there? Well, no. I mean, it, it's simply been the case for years now that whenever there has been a Western American-led intervention, that America has been forced to do most of the military heavy lifting. And I think it's a good thing that they should say to their allies, if you're going to be involved in the mission, then you should have equal responsibility for yeah, mission. But, but the reality is, of course, in Libya, that without that American firepower on the side of the rebels, uh, there's much less headway being made. Sure, well, th this is what you get if you keep on cutting defense budgets like we do in this country. You can't do the things you'd like to do. Uh, you can't stop people from being massacred by dictators. You can't intervene when you would like to, even if you would really like to, because you don't have the arms well, to do uh, it. Well, you know, the UN mandate was quite clear uh, on Libya, and yet now there are those who are saying that what is actually happening now, de facto, is a decapitation policy. Is that a good idea in Libya? It's not a good idea anywhere because it's illegal under any um, law. Uh, but what, what is happening is that the United States and its allies in the West are going into countries, especially in the Middle East, Iraq is the catastrophic example, um, and not being able to have any post-occupation or invasion or fire, firing power uh, Plan. So, the, so without that idea of an end game, what we're in danger of doing, you're suggesting, is repeating the mistakes of Iraq, that actually simply removing Saddam Hussein was clearly not the answer. Well, it was not the answer because it destroyed the country in the wake of that invasion. So, um, uh, what do you think then, Douglas May? Do you think the decapitation in, let's move on to talk about Syria, what do you do with Syria? What do you do with President Assad? Well, first of all, the decapitation of the, of the uh, Saddam regime in Iraq was not the problem. The problem was the aftermath of it and the terrible lack of planning for it. The thing that in, in, a, in any uh, uh, intervention like this, you have to decide what you want to achieve and then what is achievable. And in a case like Libya, it seems at the moment that planes are flying over Libya and the one thing in the mission that is achievable and is desirable, i.e. the decapitation, Decapitation of the Gaddafi regime is the one thing that our troops aren't allowed to do. Ian Bremer, would the decapitation policy be a policy that would be attractive to Americans just now? It seemed that that's what, in a sense, it was started out to be, albeit unstated. Look, I, I don't think that decapitation is something they actively want yet, in part because they don't know who these rebels are. It's not very satisfying, I know, in the 24-7 media cycle mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. to take your time around these things. But the reason you've got CIA operatives right now on the ground in places like Mistrata and Benghazi is precisely so they can understand uh, what the insurgency is actually about. The U.S. has a checkered history of dealing with insurgencies that they, ha yeah. that they don't know any of the history of. And so, you know, really, I think you're not going to 
destroy Qaddafi with air power alone. It's going to take time. But frankly, the Obama administration would like to take time uh, because uh, they don't want to end up with a destroyed infrastructure and nobody to actually govern the place. For now, they've defended the rebels. Uh, you have effectively, um, you know, sort of two groups that are going to be sitting there for a long time. You're not going to have a lot of fighting because of the sandstorms and the weather in Libya over the summer. Arab Spring doesn't turn to Arab summer in terms of <laughs> well, fighting season. Well, well, uh, and, and it's going to take time. Well, let's look. Well, you know, you, you might have heard Anne-Marie Slaughter saying there that for future interventions, the bar is going to be set very high. But we have a situation now in, in Syria where, you know, there are real fears about the deaths in Syria and the crackdown. Would there be any military intervention in Syria, do you think, by uh, the Americans under the guise, of course, of a UN mandate? Or do you think that's out of the question now? Well, I don't think that you're going to see a UN mandate. I mean, let's keep in mind the only reason you got a UN mandate on Libya is because Gaddafi is the North Korea of North Africa. He's hated by both the Iranians and the Saudis. That's actually hard to pull off. Uh, only <laughs> Israel manages it, and they've got nukes, so you don't get to attack them. Um, you know, I mean, only after the Arab League said, please bomb these guys, and uh, you know, an organization we haven't heard from the United States for decades, and then the French, the French said, please go ahead, and the Brits said, go ahead, did the United States finally go in. That shows you, that's the exception that proves the rule. It shows you how high the bar has become for actual military intervention. And the ability to get the United States to engage in actual military attacks, whether we're talking about Bahrain, where the Saudis have come in uh, on the side of, you know, effectively repressing and shoring up a consolidated authoritarian regime, or in Syria, given what's happening in Bashar Assad, I don't think you're going to see it from the U.S. anytime soon. And Rana Kabani, because uh, I take it that intervention in terms of decapitation is never a good idea is what you said, then that would not be a chosen idea for your chosen idea for Syria. So what is the answer in Syria? It's a real conundrum because um, one part of the problem is that these dictators, whether Qaddafi or Assad, have been brought in from the cold mm -hmm. and have been um, feted and, and received in Western capitals over the last few years for business contracts or for whatever cynical reasons. Um, so now to say that we're going to go in and decapitate regimes that we were trying to um, foster, you know. It, it wasn't cynical to try to get Gaddafi to give up his WMD program. That wasn't cynical. That was a deeply practical but, but what, thing. But, well, let's move on um, and talk about Syria, though. But, what, is the, what is the practical thing you do then? I mean, in what, whose national interest is it? to remove Assad? It's in a lot of people's national interests, uh, it's the security interests of the whole region. Uh, is it? Assad, no, I mean, yes, Assad, Assad, Syria, not, is not only a dictatorship and a brutal one, it's also a terror funding state, it has terrorists ha harbored on its property, it, it, it provides a sanctuary to Hamas and Hezbollah, and is a regional destabilizer. But how do you know, I mean this is the whole point about uh, Libya and indeed, you know, Afghanistan, right? How do you know, without, as we were talking about, a civil society mm. there, which is what really underpinned the Egyptian change, how do you know what's going to come next? Well, look, the point is, is if the people rise up and the dictator decides to gun down as many people as possible to stay in power, you have to make a decision whether or not it is right to stop that dictator. You then have to decide if you would think that dictator is somebody who it's good to keep. And in the case of Assad, it would be good to lose him. Thank you all very much indeed.